Mr. Speaker, a bit of personal history. I was the son of parents who lived through the Great Depression. My dad, Tony, put food on the table by being a locomotive engineer. He worked at Algoma Steel in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, and he served as secretary treasurer of his union. My mom, Helen, was a busy stay-at-home mother to five kids. We were happy, but I don't remember us having a whole lot of money when we were growing up. As a kid in grade school, I can count the number of times on one hand that we actually went out to a real restaurant. My mom's attitude was, why waste good money on a restaurant when we have food at home? I remember if there was a big sale at the grocery store or something, um, we'd sometimes get steak at home, but it, it was a rare treat. The reason I remember that was when we'd have it, my mom always had the same thing to say. She'd say, that steak costs 99 cents a pound, so make sure you eat all of it, even the fat. It was a good lesson in life, though. At an early age, kids in my family learned the value of money, and we learned that you never waste anything. My parents gave me a great life lesson, and I was happy, but those lessons stuck with me. And you know what, Mr. Speaker, I, I think a lot of Canadians these days can relate to those lessons. They understand the value of hard work and money and they want value for their tax dollars from governments. I know these have been challenging times with the COVID pandemic. Due to this terrible pandemic, governments were forced to shut down the normal economy. As such, people needed an income. Governments had a duty to come to the rescue, but they spent a lot of money, especially this liberal government. I admit it, a good chunk of it was needed. In fact, it was conservatives who pushed the Liberals to increase financial benefits to Canadians during this pandemic. Right at the beginning of the pandemic, we fought to get a big increase in the small business wage subsidy. However, as we enter the road to recovery, we need a plan back to fiscal balance. It's a lesson my parents and many of our parents and grandparents learned the hard way. And I know many of my constituents feel the same way. I regularly survey my constituents for their views on important issues of the day. And one question I asked them recently was, are you worried about the federal debt? The vast majority, more than 80%, said they are very worried. Yet, the Liberals failed to take prudent measures in this budget. Despite record spending, there's no meaningful action to reduce our massive debt load. And massive is the key word here. The debt is more than a trillion dollars and climbing. The Liberals don't even have a long-term plan to return to balance. This is a shocking failure by this government. It was only a year ago that the Prime Minister was boasting. He was boasting of Canada's fiscal capacity to offer supports during the pandemic. He said his government could spend lots of money because of the prudent decisions they made previously. Okay, so why then isn't he making those prudent decisions for the future? As COVID made clear, we can't foresee these events. Just consider this government's failure early on to recognize how serious COVID itself was. Early on, we conservative we conservatives gave this advice, shut down flights from COVID hotspots. The government said we were being alarmist, even racist. So what's going to happen during the next crisis that we face with our now limited fiscal capacity? We don't have the capacity to keep on spending. The prime minister boasts of prudent decisions, but he fails to make them. Prior to COVID, this government showed a complete lack of fiscal discipline. Instead of prudently managing taxpayers' money, the Liberals ran deficit after deficit. During the good times, the Liberals added more than $72 billion to the national debt. To put that into perspective, that's nearly $2,000 of new debt for every man, woman, and child in Canada. Continuous deficits and endless debt leave us vulnerable. It's not sustainable. In a crisis, you need a healthy balance sheet. Who said that? Well, 
an expert did. That's the view of Philip Cross. He's the former economic analyst at Statistics Canada. When conservatives were in power, we were fiscally responsible. We came out of the 2008 financial crisis better than any country in the G7. Here's what Cross said about that. Strong balance sheets in Canada stood it in good stead to endure the recession and emerge into recovery. The recession was shorter and milder in Canada than in other G7 nations, partly because the flow of credit was not disrupted as it was in other nations. And a large pool of savings was available to finance spending when income fell temporarily. So what's going to happen in the next crisis if this Liberal government gambles our safety net? Most Canadians know about the value of money. These Liberals have to learn that too. Let's go over just some of the Liberals' useful spend, use, useless spending. Earlier this year, I asked an order paper question on the expenses related to having government employees work from home. Now, working from home was, of course, an important safety feature, and I think we can all accept reasonable expenses. However, can anyone really justify spending $2,815 of taxpayers' money for a desk or $1,160 for a work chair? Uh, having gone through that document, those are hardly isolated incidents. It's only scratching the surface. This government's contempt for transparency has been evident for years. However, they've doubled down during the COVID crisis. They're actually hiding crucial information on how taxpayers' money is being spent. Even a former parliamentary budget officer has criticized the government for lack of transparency. For example, members from across the aisle on the Transport Committee recently talked out the clock to avoid accountability. Instead of being transparent about their mismanagement of the infrastructure bank, they tried to bury the details. But the details, of course, eventually come out, like how the infrastructure bank recently paid out nearly $4 million for executive terminations, or how the bank has completed zero projects in four years, and how it's projected to use lose billions of taxpayers' dollars. Building needed projects in Canada seems to be too complicated for this Liberal budget, but they don't seem to have any issue funding the China-controlled Asian Infrastructure Bank to build projects outside of Canada. The Liberals have funneled tens of millions of dollars to this Chinese state-run bank. This is despite the Chinese communist regime is holding two of our citizens against their will on trumped up charges. How exactly is the Asian infrastructure bank good value for money? As we're racking up more and more debt, I wonder just how much of it is being wasted. This is an important issue, Mr. Speaker, especially for younger generations. We're passing this debt on to the next generation to pay off, and we owe it to them not to bury them in debt. Even worse, Mr. Speaker, this spending isn't even geared to growing the economy, but don't take my word on it. That's the analysis of the independent parliamentary budget author, officer. He said this, budget 2021 estimates overstate the impact of stimulus spending over the next three years. So despite massive unsustainable spending, we're not even going to see additional growth. One thing that's also readily available is the government's strategy is not prepared for an increase in interest rates. Even a minor increase could have a devastating effect on our long-term national finances. My constituents are demanding answers, Mr. Speaker. Like my parents, they know the value of money. They work hard for their money. They expect and demand that their money isn't wasted. Canadians know that liberal spending is out of control. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, questions and comments? Qu'est-ce uh, commentaire? La députée de Saint-Jean. Honorable Member for Saint-Jean. 
I thank my colleague for his speech. I understand that for the Conservatives it's important to reduce spending. But there are some services that remain essential. For example, the support to farmers. It's $1,500 to help them bring in temporary foreign workers. And that money is going to be cut down to $750 in the coming days. So I'd like to hear my colleague on this issue, on that particular um, issue. Does he think that the help for farmers should be uh, extended because farmers are still facing fees uh, and will be in the coming weeks? The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Edmonton Greaseback. Well, you know, obviously I'm from... Western Canada from Alberta. Um, farmers built this country. Agriculture is absolutely vital. And the bigger picture, let's look at the bigger picture instead of cherry picking little little items out of this uh, this budget. The bigger picture is we need a sustainable future and we can't continue. We cannot continue to spend as if there is no tomorrow because if we continue to do, to do that, there will be no tomorrow. Questions and comments? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to pose a question. Uh, I find it interesting how the Conservative narrative on the fiscal capacity of Canada has been used as, a, as an excuse to oppose measures that are actually going to help vulnerable Canadians that have been impacted. I'd like to pass on to the Honourable Member that whether he takes his pick between Moody's, S&P, DBRS, they've all reaffirmed Canada's AAA credit rating. We had the lowest debt to GDP ratio in the G7 and the IMF had said, had we not launched a record spending to support Canadian workers and businesses, we would have had a similar debt to GDP ratio with a much bigger negative impact on our economy. So my question to the Honourable Member does he agree with his party leader who opposed CERB? Did he agree with his party who voted against extension to the emergency measures? And why does he use the fiscal situation in Canada to oppose measures that are actually helping people in their time of need? Well, member for Edmonton Griesbach. Mr. Speaker, that's rather rich coming from the member across the way. Um, we work to improve many of these programs. I, I fully admit that there is a lot of spending that was absolutely vital. When governments shut down economies, of course you can't leave people in the lurch. You have to help them out. And we were the party. It was our party that improved these programs. And it's, it's, it's ridiculous to, to say that somehow we're opposed to it. We're opposed to runaway spending. And we know that the wolf is going to be at the door one day. And you look back to see what was done under the Harper government, how we came out the shining star out of the G7 countries out of 2008. And I don't take my word for that. Take, take the word of financial experts. We were a star. And that's how, when we are in government, we will be in far better shape than what this government is going to leave Canadians next time we have a major crisis. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and, you know, I know my uh, colleague spoke a lot about deficit, but here's the thing. While millions of people are worried about losing their jobs, Canada's 20 richest people have increased their wealth. Instead of making the richest pay the cost for the economic uh, recovery, the Conservatives, very much like the Liberals, want to protect the profits of the richest. My, my question for the member is, can the member please explain why he refuses to make the richest pay their fair share? I'm a member for Edmonton, Griesbach. Well, you know, everybody has to pay their fair share, obviously, but it's also people who create wealth in this country who they are the people who are risking to create wealth. You look at the young startups, look at young entrepreneurs, they're starting from nothing. <laughs> you look at the, the, the history of growth in any, in any developed nation, it starts with great ideas and, it, and we have to cultivate these great ideas. I know that the uh, certain members of the NDP and the NDP philosophy is just take as much money from possible as, as as can bear and redistribute wealth. That is not a good philosophy. It has not worked in any country in the world. There are many recent failures and long-time failures. And no, we conservatives do not believe in punishing people for good ideas and growing economies and creating wealth. 
Resuming debate, the Honorable Member for Calgary.